possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTGA podcast. Mikey Stafford, I've returned after my midterm break. Thank you, Rory O'Neill. Um, or Panty Bliss, as I'm yes. now being called. Is it? Yes, yes, thank you. You did a wonderful job. You didn't put a foot wrong, Rory, shall we say. Um, we're here to review the uh, Allianz Football League action for the weekend. I'm joined by two crestfallen men. Uh, Niall McCoy, fresh back from his trip to the Hyde, follows beloved Armagh. And <laughs> at least David Tumberty's trip to Cusick Park was a bit shorter. But... Neither gentlemen enjoyed their Sunday afternoon football, I don't think, watching their counties kind of collapse. David, um, you may not be missing playing so much, but I'd say you might have been regretting being in the stand yesterday a little bit. Yeah, very hard to uh, watch. Well, it was an enjoyable uh, 65 minutes anyway, but um, <laughs> it was just the last, last uh, five minutes of injury, injury time that we just, we just fell apart, really. It's... Um, I don't know, there were just too many mistakes, put too much pressure on ourselves and um, didn't take advantage of the spare man. And I thought um, Daniel Flynn coming off the bench, uh, I suppose 10 minutes into the second half, I suppose, really turned the game. He brought a great bit of life to Kildare in the forwards and he was full of running and uh, he was badly missed for Kildare for the last few games. And we were... Uh, Hopefully, if we we thought he might have stayed on the bench for another while. But... <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is this yeah. is a safe space as it's a support group for you now this morning. Uh, <laughs> Niall, have you got a? I'd say there's dents in your steering wheel from how hard you were gripping it on the way home in anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a, an eternal pessimist, but uh, I turned to need my wife at halftime to say, "Well, it's ever for the match. If we stay within five points with that breeze, I would have fancied us to come through it." So. When we go in a point up, I was uh, I was looking at the league table to see and wondering how many games we have to make to reach a league final and different things like that. The, the game was one at half time. Uh, TV probably didn't do justification for the strength of the wind. There was swirling and um, it was going across towards the terrace. So it was a difficult win, but you're just seeing our were cutting through them uh, with ease in the first half, butchering goal chances uh, regularly. Did the same in the second half, and it was just one of those halves where where everything that could go wrong for them did go wrong for them. And um, you could sense that at that opening few minutes, that opening salvo from uh, from Roscommon was to move from behind to a couple of points up, and you just got the feeling there was a great atmosphere from the home crowd, a uh, really good atmosphere. They got behind their team, they got the uh, they got a bit of momentum. Arma. Brian O'Neill and Stephen Campbell struggle in the second half, who have been probably Armagh's best two players over the last couple of years. And I just thought when those two boys weren't at top form, there was a few sort of questions being asked and boys maybe weren't able to pick up the mantle in, in place of them. So a bit uh, for me, it's a huge two points missed because they'd done all the work in the first half. They really had, and then it just sort of capitulated, really. Yeah. We'll get into we'll get into it a bit more later, lads. You can get your um comfort blankets and like uh, curl up in a fetal position. We'll discuss it a bit more, Rory. Um, uh, I think we we might we might have struck on something new in the G. Well, not new, but it was it was notable this weekend from Brewster Park to Parky Cueve, Clonus, um, and both Cusick Parks. Um, the idea of well, rugby have had it for a while. The idea of the finisher. Uh, you know, someone who comes off the bench, you know, kind of to make your team stronger rather than to replace your strongest player. Um, now, some of this is down to age, some of this is down to return to injury, but it, it, it was striking to notice the impact that Seamus Quigley had for Fermanagh, <clears throat> Kieran Martin had for Westmeath, the aforementioned uh, Daniel Flynn had for Kildare, James McCarthy, obviously, that's just a ludicrous substitution to be able to make. Um, and Jack bring, McCaffrey. And Jack McCaffrey, bringing on the two boys. And still Court made a fist, but we'll get to that too, Rory. Uh, Conor McManus, obviously, he has been a bit more of a bench player of late, but he definitely... He, he had a role to play. You hear managers say it all the time. Oh, it's a 20-man game now, yada, yada, yada. But I think it, it really is, isn't it? It's like, oh, big time. And, nothing and if you can't yeah. make that sub, in, yeah. sub like impact. If you, you look at um, Saturday night, even, the, the depth Mayo have, for instance, bringing mm. Killian O'Connor and Paddy Durkin off the bench. And at a time when they probably just needed to steady the ship a small bit, I, you know, I think it's uh, it's 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 a bit, it's, it's, it, it'll probably become more pronounced as the season goes on because... One of the 
I think one of the fallouts of this condensed calendar, and I refuse to call it a split season anymore because, I mean, what's the split season? All the leagues started yesterday in Dublin and, you know, off we go on that, but we won't go down that road. I think one of the fallouts potentially um, with this condensed calendar, and I think it's probably something that we won't really start to see the effects of it, maybe for a year or two, is going to be the, the workload and that players are now coming under. I think you're going to see a lot more injuries. Um, there's like amateur players don't have a huge amount of time to recover. And they're basically going week to week playing, you know, very high attritional, high quality games. And I think the panels and the depth of your panels are going to be absolutely essential. And I and having people to come in off the bench is going to, you know, utterly essential, I would suggest. And um, it's just, I suppose, for the teams that over the weekend were able to draw from you know, numbers 15 to 20. I think that that'll probably be the type of thing that'll give their managements the most, the most satisfaction. And um, I think that's probably an area where Armagh maybe, I mean, Niall would obviously be a lot more uh, au fait with the kind of depth that Armagh would have, but they might need a little more depth. Like they didn't, they weren't able to maybe pull the kind of quality off the bench that maybe some of the other top ranking teams would have. Would that be fair, Niall? Yeah, it would be. It would be. A lot of entries, but a lot of entries around that middle sector, Rory. You know, uh, mm. Niall Grimley's not fully fit. Kieran Mack is not fully fit. They only feel a bit parts. Ben Creeley, who started all last year, he's out for another few weeks. Oshin O'Neill's long-term injury. Stephen Sheridan was in front of me at the Tars. He's injured. So they had the entries that every team's having, but they're having it around... Uh, the one area which is a massive problem for Arma and they haven't been able to worse as you say there like what happened I think Mikey talked about happened Brewster Park two goals off the bench for Fermanagh you know uh, what Massive Dublin win. brought on like what Dublin and Mayo brought on so Arma didn't have that sort of uh, step up those those winners Connor Turbot came in who would be in that category a boy that can come on and win a match but it just by that time the game had got away but you're right you're right um the other thing about when you've got players coming on, you know, Mikey says about managers saying there about being a 20-man game and it's a bit of a cliche. Uh, players aren't stupid. Like, you know, they know who's starting and different things. But if you do have teams that are open and Dublin were the masters of the under Jim Gavin, having players coming on and making those contributions at training, boys all of a sudden aren't just thinking about getting into that first 15. They're thinking about being part of that match day 20 players, you know, and it just raises the competitive enough. If you're, if you're able to accept as a player that I'm going to perform my role, whether that be from the start or coming off the bench, and it feels genuine, it feels like you're genuinely helping the team and it's important rather than your sub coming on trying to rescue a situation, it, it just must be a manager's dream. Mm-hmm. Um any insight into those conversations with uh, Colin Collins, maybe David, of you know, kind of being put to you that maybe you'd be better coming off the bench, making that impact? Because it's going to be a conversation, I think, like, teams are going to see it now, as Rory says, it's condensed season, there's a lot of matches. There will be a point where maybe Desi Farrell says, actually, you know what, James McCarthy, I don't need you playing 60 or 70 minutes this week, <laughs> but it'd be definitely good to use you for 20 minutes. And James McCarthy could probably take that quite well, but you'd probably get some younger players or guys who are kind of confidence players or consider themselves marquee forwards who might who might balk at that idea when really it might be good management. So, um, have you ever experienced that conversation, and how would it have been broached? Uh, don't worry, I've uh, last latter few years of my uh, playing career, I was uh, I remember a few fellas telling me that you'll be you'll be an impact sub, you'll come on for the last 10, 15, 20 minutes. But um, I suppose for me, I suppose a player that's always started and it's very hard to take, I suppose. Um, and as you said, a young fella to, to hear that, that I'm going to be sitting on the bench for 40, 50 minutes and then coming on to try and make an impact. Um, it's very hard for them where you've got um, Jack McCaffrey the last day, like he's a man that uh, would take it and uh, James McCarthy. They'd be able to understand it a lot better than other players. Um, but like if you see if like I pity the the wing back for uh or wing forward for Cork last night when you see um the two but are the um what's this uh Jack McCaffrey. McCaffrey coming on the pitch and his first <laughs> run was straight up the field at like a fifty yard run and um but like that's the t- that's it. Like Daniel Finn was a, as I said before, was a massive, massive um impact last night. He was just full of legs. And you see a fresh player coming on to you. Um 
it's just it's just hard for the defender to 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 take after doing 40 50 minutes of running yeah yeah um before we get into the matches just just a word to dial on um peter canavan our, our new uh big name uh punditry signing he he's really he's bought into it as uh ivan mentioned to him last night on league sunday uh he was quite happy to criticize one Derek canavan on the television which i think <laughs> you know it shows great commitment to the cause doesn't it <laughs> yeah i love it i love it i love it uh, yeah here um not that a boy needs much criticism he's unbelievable like but uh Peter's the sort of boy, he's not going to give him, there's no nepotism there. If Derek Calvin needs to pick up the arse, he's going to get it from Peter, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's the same It's the same thing with my father. You come home, whatever game you play, if you have a bad game, he goes, what were you at today? You tap on yourself. <laughs> so, as I, as I always said, my father always says to me, a clap in the back is never too far away from a kick up the arse, and yeah, exactly. that's what fathers are there for. It is, it is. Um, they do They do seem to be a little bit... Um, crestfallen or down in the mouth at the moment are Tyrone Pundits but we, we might have a quick mention of that in a while <laughs> uh, more so from the Galway point of view listen we'll, we'll, we'll start at, at the hide I'm afraid Niall um, t- <laughs> so <laughs> in your own words Niall tell us what happened no um, listen was this was this a case of were they trying to sit on a lead here and it went horribly wrong or did Roscommon just cope with playing against the wind a lot better obviously the penalty came and the penalty was a little bit controversial I would say I think it was a little bit of a harsh call um but it just how much of it would you put down to our man how much of you put down to the fact that Roscommon have done this in their three games so far they've been down at half time and they've come roaring back into it yeah, and they've dealt very well against the wind against in the second half against Throne as well. So uh, they're showing real real sort of, you know, they're, they're really dealing with it well. And, you know, we, we talk about the wind being this big factor, but we're, we're coming increasingly, you're seeing teams dealing yeah. so well, playing against it. And I suppose the ball doesn't do the work as much as it did 20, 30 years ago. Teams are running and they're hitting on the counter and they're so pacey. And that's what Roscommon did in the second half. Yeah, so they just picked their moments. Um, I thought it was, it was a fairly simple tactic, uh, when Armour coming off the right hand side in the second half, uh, which would have been more advantageous for shooting, they were putting on a really intense press. Uh, they were letting Armour get the ball on the left hand side, giving by space, um, and putting almost a trap of temptation there to take shots. And you know we saw five or six efforts trail hit the post on the left hand side or trail left, and that that's for me. If I was Kier McGinney, I'd be like, well, that's a very simple trap you know, that you're, you're falling in there now where you're taking shots and positions where low percentage because of the conditions. Um, very simple thing for us common to do. I, I think a lot of credit has to go to us common. Arma were, were very poor after the break. And it's the second match in a row where their third quarter performance have just died on their feet. It was the same against Mayo and then had the stern comeback. Uh, yesterday, their, their forwards just in the second half didn't get going. They, they were making basic errors, apart from Andrew Mernon. And I know I've said this a number of times on the podcast, this man is absolutely fantastic. And he was the best player in the pitch by a country mile again. Yes, I don't think he wasted the ball. But Roscommon came out second half and were just sharper. They're sharper. They got a couple of scores to move in fast. Pretty much what happened maybe in that last few minutes down in Clarence there. Momentum. We talk about it at elite sport level. We if, if we knew how to stop momentum, we could bottle and sell it and make a fortune. But it's just one of those things. The penalty call, yeah, it, it probably was in real time. It looked the penalty to me. Watching it last night, I can I, I think Kieran's right. You could make a case either way. You know, he got a great hand on the ball. His yeah. trailing right hand probably did make contact at such speed. Um, the ref probably always going to give that. Um, I thought it was pretty clear that Smith was going to go to his right. Uh, just the way he was shaping up, but I suppose that's the instincts of Ethan Rafferty there, who made an absolutely brilliant save. He did make a very good save. Yeah, yeah. very good save, very good save, and it could not. Russ Common were three points up at that stage with a minute to go, and if they had a loss from there, <laughs> that would have been an awful way because it should have been just been fist over the bar. But a lot of a lot of credit has to go. I thought Andy Smith really came into the game very well in the second half. I thought Ben O'Carr looked so lively, so so lively. Um, after maybe 20 minutes of struggling midfield, this really took over. I've mentioned the Arma injuries around that sector and they're feeling it, but it was common started to dominate. Um, again, Rafi, I thought, had a good game and I'm a huge fan. I'm just surprised that they didn't go for a couple of reliever kicks. Certainly with the wind at their back, he would have had the distance to bypass that midfield and hit Mernon, who was in 40 acres of space up in the half forward line, full forward line. I thought, you know, that's a... 
a fairly routine tactic that clubs employ, you know, when they when they are struggling in the middle, especially with a breeze behind them. But full credit, as I say, there was common three wins from three, mm. two of those wins coming, uh, well, all three coming on the back of very good second half performances, two of them against very strong breezes against Trone and Arma. Um six points from six. A really, a really vocal, vocal support that got behind them and really got drove them on in that second half. And I think is it is it Mayo up next for them? Um uh, no, no it's not Mayo, no, it's uh, uh, Monaghan. Clonus. Monaghan Clonus. Yeah, yeah Mayo have Mayo have thrown, that's right. Mm. Um but they're in they're in Position number one, like after three games, they couldn't ask for better. And they're safe. They're probably safe now as well. They're probably imagine. safe. Like yeah. six, point, six points generally keeps you up. Like you know, yeah. um, mm. the only thing yeah. it's a tight, it's a tight division this year. So the, one more point will probably guarantee their safety, Rory. You know, mm. and the way they're playing, you'd expect them down in the height to get at least another point. Oh so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're they're listen full value, full value. Uh, as much as Arma were very hard <laughs> in the second half, full. Full credit to Roscommon. They really stepped it up and, and were deserving winners. Armagh butchered a lot of goal chances, but Roscommon deserved it. Yeah. I thought it was a brilliant game, though, Mikey. Mm. Um, I mean, off like how many shots off the posts, last gas blocks, how many 1v1s did we see? Actually, it must have been a record for 1v1s and, you know, lads clean through uh, with a 1v1. Uh, was it was it Lennon at, again? I think it was Lennon at, that made that block at the end of the first That game. was one of the most. I, I mean... So brave and committed, yeah. Yeah. and re- a really old-fashioned skill. Yeah, you know, balls cleared off the line. A couple of off the ball mm. incidents, which it was our man, I suppose. They're, they're, <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of hard for the course. Yeah, um, uh, Robbie, uh, Robbie Dolan, I think, got a score just before half time, and I like, I just, it just made me kind of whoa. It was, it was outside of the boot, outside yeah. of the right. Oh yeah, on the right hand side, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely gorgeous score now I hate outside of the boot I coach under nines and I'm like if I see anyone kicking outside <laughs> yeah. of the boot it's a big whistle and like hey cut that cut that out but you, you when it comes off it just looks spectacular it, did, um, it, it was it just did. a brilliant game I thought both teams actually, deserve a lot of credit I thought that was a key moment actually Rory um, I didn't it wasn't on Alliance League Sunday but a couple of seconds before that score there was a yeah. a line ball that mm. The Armagh fans and Stan were very unhappy about that, mm-hmm. and that led to the score. I don't know if it uh, showed a replay uh, on the live coverage or whether or not it was, but that was Armagh were two up at that stage. Exactly, what, it was eight or, six, and that made it eight seven. Then going in at half time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, which big probably maybe mm-hmm. not massive in the context, but mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's it's interesting to look at the table now, David. You got the the, the three Connacht teams, as Niall says, it, it's tight. The three Connacht teams are on on top of the table. Um, which I suppose when, when you it's pretty much the Western Seaboard Championship we have going here, as the cameramen will testify after <laughs> the work they had to do. But I don't think they've most people, you know, as strong as Galway and Mayo can be. I think just I think a lot of people would have been expecting a, a slightly more Ulster tinge to this to this league, and nobody was expecting Ross Common to be fa- to top. So Davy Burke deserves a lot of credit, doesn't he? Yeah, you see him there yesterday at the final whistle. I'd say I, I suppose the celebrations looked like he was more or less saying to himself we're kind of safe we can go off and enjoy ourselves no I suppose for the rest of the league but um, yeah I'd say like I know every team are back um, at the end of uh, November was it 24th of November all teams were back but I'd say like individually I'd say a lot of teams were back earlier than that because you see Mayo Roscommon they're flying it at the moment Kerry look very sluggish Um I know they're missing Shawnee O'Shea and David Clifford um, Paddy's only back a few weeks but um, it's just like Mayo and Roscommon, they've like they've gone gone early with the heavy training sessions. Uh, yeah. Will they hold up? Will they hold up for that for the rest of the league or and into the championship? Well, D- David, Which, I I would wager that seeing as they're playing each other in the in the Connacht final Con- on the 9th yeah. of April, I would say they're yeah. both planning to like Roscommon have done it. They've hit their magic number. I'd say Mayo yeah. want to do it pretty soon, and then they'll start freewheeling. Is that how you'd see that's it? That's it. Yeah, pro- probably. Let's go go hard at the start of the league and um, kind of set yourself in towards the last few games and kind of rest a few players. And stuff like that but um yeah. yeah it's 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 tight it's very tight up there and it's uh it's great to watch the league is national league is it's uh, it's great it's a brilliant <laughs> brilliant uh, league i wish we had it for the championship it was all these games would be this close and stuff but yeah. and there's great crowds there's great crowds following every, any, every team around the country so yeah it, they really are like you know you, yeah. were, you, you were in that bright orange uh caravan yesterday in Ireland, but you do seem to be getting crowds and beyond crowds we seem rory to be getting this phenomenon of 
crowds turn it up two hours early to make sure they get a seat in the covered stand again makes sense in february but mm-hmm. um it's a hell of a commitment <laughs> oh yeah and it, it look it, i think it it's been i suppose it's not exactly uh a, a news flash to suggest that the best competition is the uh, is the yeah. league and it probably has been for a while i think the worry but the early rounds the problem the early is rounds. <laughs> see you see you yeah. see this is this is it and and we're already starting to caveat an awful lot of our, the performances we're looking at already Kerry. so like for instance Kerry, right and that's that's one even dublin i i felt as much as i thought cork huffed and puffed yesterday you could probably say I, I, I Dublin looked just a little leggy to me, and you, you again you're starting to question what are we seeing here, and it's because teams are having to condense all of this prep for championship while the leagues are running, so they can't. Yeah. So, so you're 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 not entirely sure what it is you're witnessing, and as I said at the very beginning, and this was more really in relation to. Hurling analysis. So I think taking an absolutist position on anything we see at this time of the year is risky. But look, I all you can go on is what 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 you see in front of you. And I think, I mean, look, Castle Bar on Saturday night. I thought, and I know we we, we haven't shifted on to Mayo Kerry yet. And I don't know. Oh, no, let's consider ourselves shifted onto there now, Roy. So yeah. Fire away. <laughs> don't I, don't hold anything back. I I thought it was one of the most scintillating explosive 35 minutes of football I've seen from Mayo for a long time I know people will say oh look it's only the league you don't do that to Kerry even a Kerry half switched on you do not annihilate them ever I've never seen a Kerry team look and be made look as poor as they were on Saturday night and that could be a Kerry team playing a Rockdus Cup or Tiddly Wings. They'll still want to be competitive. And for them to l- look so far off it, I would say, suggest, and all people will say, oh, they could be in doing this, players with Sigerson and all of that type of stuff. But Janie, I would suggest Jack O'Connor be a little bit worried. Mm-hmm. I think he would be very, very worried in terms of what he witnessed on Saturday night. But it yeah. just shows there um, with the last... Uh, um... Shawnee O'Shea and David Clifford, you take them two out of the Kerry team, mm-hmm. they, they're, they're struggling. And, and a big problem, well, not a big problem, right? I, I don't necessarily see it being an insurmountable one. I think they have a problem at midfield. I, I'm not yeah. entirely sure if Dermot O'Connor and Jack Barry is the kind of combination that you're going to need. Ockham Bohr only came on, maybe struggling for a bit of form, maybe struggling for a bit of fitness. I think David Moran's star will start to burn ever brighter oh, well, as, yeah. as the weeks and months go on. It may even be the case, it may even be the case that they may have to consider shifting Shawnee O'Shea into midfield yeah. and then you're into a game of Jenga because you're starting to pull pieces of your puzzle that used to work out to try and kind of maybe firefight in different areas I I, I I think he's got a lot he's got a lot on his plate I think mm-hmm. Jack O'Connor would be a busy man for the next couple of weeks I would imagine uh, we can often be uh, fall into the trap here of because often we have Eamon Fitzmaurice on us of talking a lot about Kerry um, so I think how Rory started this um, David <laughs> to, to continue it in that Mayo were bloody good for 35 minutes and then didn't have to be fantastic for the second 35 yeah. minutes. But it does seem to, in the forwards, you know, they, they've struck on something. Um, they've, you know, Aidan O'Shea playing as kind of That's a target chance. man for 60, for 75% of the game and coming out when he needs to, um, you know, and that's benefiting a lot of people, but it's definitely it's benefiting Jordan Flynn James. more than anybody, as far as I Jordan Flynn's the timing of his runs, it just seems to be Aiden O'Shea has three or four carry men on his back, and suddenly there's a big gap through the middle for Jordan Flynn to run into, or James Carr. James um, Carr, the, yeah. yeah. The two of them, they're just O'Shea is just a magnet for defenders and um obviously has the strength to hold them off for as long as it takes to find a teammate. Um it's not rocket science, is it, David? But when it works, it's just fantastic. It is, yeah. I was watching Mayo at this, um, the last few games. But it's not like, you know, down through the years where they, it would be uh, Aidan O'Shea with a hand up, give it in to me long and high, wait for this high ball looper to come into you. It's not. It's like it's pop passes in front of him and he's strong. He's getting out in front of the defender like in a defender. And he's so big. He's quick, isn't he? He's, like, he he's, he's quick. quick enough over yeah. 5-10 yards. You'll Mickey Quinn. That's all he needs. 
he looks like he's got legs. Like he looks like he's got legs, and his hands are hands are brilliant. I remember there was, was there three or four fellas around him one stage, and he was bring, I don't know, he was bringing his hands around the circle, he hit the two balls and he, or the ball in his hand, and he's popping it off with his left to right. And like when you've got James Carr and Rhino Dunne who coming off you, and it just makes their job very easy. Yeah, I oh, know he's. It, they they just seem to have struck on something, um, yeah. Niall. And as I say, it's you know it's it's not. A lot of it isn't terribly complicated, and as that's highlighted in Ali on Sunday last night, and which may mean they're going to taper off quite a lot. It involves a lot of running. It means like the lads in the middle third of the field are transitioning into defence and into attack pretty much constantly, which is pretty uh, high intensity game, isn't it? Yeah, and um, listen, McStay, he's stuck to what he said. He's always push for O'Shea to be that smart target man. David said it, or it's, it's the quality, you know, target man's got two facets to it. It's what he does, but it's also the quality of ball that comes into him. And yeah. it's not that he said loopy ball that a fullback loves to punch clear. They did that the first ball in against Arma, and I think Arma Kier played it. And from there on, they put beautiful ball. And, you know, the, the Arma players were bouncing off him like Skittles. And he's just, uh, he's an informed, confident Aidan O'Shea, who has a manager who has full belief in him, is a massive asset. He's a player who has taken probably more criticism over the last 10 years, more unjust criticism, uh, in my opinion, than maybe any other player in the game. There has been big games where, he, where it's passed him by, no doubt, but it's just been a beacon for criticism for so many people. Uh, a lot of people have put Mayo's feelings at the final stage always down on his shoulders. And I, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. I, I think it's really exciting to watch him. Uh, it's handling there was was superb. The players around him are getting a real, real boost off what he's bringing to proceedings. He's obviously not fit to do it for 70 minutes. It's a very physical environment he's involved himself because teams are doubling, tripling up on him, trying to prevent him, and in a lot of cases, failing. And that's what's leading to the space for the likes Rain of Donahue. You know, Donahue and different boys like that. So it's, his, his, his mere presence as a functioning full forward is creating these space pockets for the other forwards and they're taking full advantage um, it's funny it's one of, one of the moments from the game uh, at the weekend was actually a score to concede I think it was Brosnan kicked just four half time from the angle mm. and they broke out and there must have been seven players they've done a superb turnover and it was a bad pass it might have been card done I can't remember just got a bit unlucky but there must have been about seven of them raced out like hers. And they would have been in. Like I, I think it could have been possibly a goal. If that one pass hadn't made it, they are gone. And Kerry turned it over in a lovely score. But even in the concession, I score, I was a bit gung-ho maybe, but I, I just thought it was brilliant. And I think Mio were fantastic to watch at the moment. And I think having a Mio team like that in the championship, we are we are writing, their, writing them off their last year against Kerry matches this day in the Mio. And all of a sudden, you're looking at them there and thinking, it's still early days. It's very early days, but this is a team that's going to have a big say in twenty. Big say, and ca- and if you yeah. hu- humor me for one second, Mikey, right? In a parallel universe, I hope that this potential conversation is happening, and an exchange of text messages or a little email or whatever, along the lines of, "Dear Kevin, I know the last time we spoke, it didn't end well." The spark just wasn't there for me, and time waits for no one. However, the spark is back, ignited by an electrifying performance in McHale Park on Saturday night. And with the benefit of mature reflection, I was wondering if the door was still open to return, and I'd be happy to contribute and play any role that would help the team achieve success. Yours in sport, Lee. And you would also (laughs) hope the response would be, Dear Lee, you're one of Mayo's greatest ever players, the door will always be open. Get yourself right for championship. It's not here till next May, June. Because right. if I was Lee Keegan, having witnessed that, and you're saying to yourself, this might be the year. This could be, <laughs> <laughs> this could be the year. And Mikey, you're going to be lo- looking at new columnists, Rory. You can tell <laughs> Rory's no longer. <laughs> Nag in the hands and hang in the hands. You can tell Rory's no longer producing the uh, GA life. <laughs> like, he's ready to jettison one of our new pundits. Yeah. I'd well, say, uh, you... well, I'll tell you though. Like, could your you colleagues imagine... won't thank you for that one. But at the same time, <laughs> I, 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 I could not help watching Mayo on Saturday night and think of Lee and say to myself, could you imagine a Lee Keegan? Because they found it. This other guy in the full back line, this young lad, Mac Bryan, who I think is an incredible find for them as well, right? Imagine Lee Keegan walking into the dressing room on top of all of this. 
powerful. It is because, like they, David, they held they held Kerry to three points in the first half, which is which is fair going. Whatever state as Roy says, Kerry are in. They're, they're not a team that held to three points for thirty five minutes very often. So, you know, there would have been fears with the loss of Lee Keegan and and Oshin Mullen that the defense was probably where they needed the most attention. But as Roy says, they've they've unearthed a couple of young fellas here and. Um, they they look solid and more than that, like any good Mayo team, they look like a defense that's ready to turn into attack at a moment's notice. Yeah, I um just watching the game there last night, as, as um, you were saying, like they're transitioning from uh, backs to forwards, and the forwards are getting back to crowd out that defense, and they're frustrating teams as well. And um, the pace they attack in is is just everybody is it's gung ho, like they're they're going in numbers and numbers. Um. But it's it's enjoyable to, to watch Mayo at the moment. Um, as I said, will they keep it up? Uh, Lee Keegan, Lee Keegan, and uh, Oshin Mullen are massive losses. Mm. Um, I, I I suppose uh, watching the I was watching the Clare game yesterday. Looking in, you're you're you'll be nearly tempted to go back. And I suppose Lee at the moment he's looking at them games and he's like, oh, what did I do? Did I <laughs> Thirty-three. That's young men. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, we'll, we'll we'll have to ask him. See if he can write a column about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. His response to Rory's uh, uh, Rory's fantasy. Um, yeah, I mean, Mikey, you, and just quickly, like you, you touched on the start there, like the the noise at Castle Bar for the Galway and uh, Kerry matches has been, you know, the league's an incredible product. It's an incredible product. We're getting all these great games, but the atmosphere, Mayo fans. Have generated in two matches. Like it's a big stadium, and sometimes the noise is lost in big stadiums, but it's been just a joy watching and seeing the the manic fan base. Like it's it's brilliant. It's just brilliant. Yeah. There was there was a friend of mine up in Castle Bar, and he took a snap of the lights in McHale Park, and he said the the roar that was going up all, all night. Uh, he said there was just, but they're just diehard supporters. They'd follow you all over the country. I remember we played them in a qualifier one year, and there was oh, there must have been twelve, thirteen thousand down in Cusy Park. Um, they're just they're just phenomenal supporters. They really are, and they've got they're they're getting excited again. And um, I, think, <laughs> I think football needs Mayo, the the Mayo fandom to be excited. Um, there's actually quite a lot to talk about in Division Two. So just a quick touch on um the last couple of games in Division One. Um, Galway three point winners, Rory over Tyrone, sixteen points to thirteen. I just want to talk about they they're down a few forwards, obviously. Um, so somebody had to step up. And it's Matthew Tierney. He kicked three points from play. Um, one of them in the second half, I, I think it's one of the most absurd scores I've ever seen. Like yeah. he like w- the wind as it was and the rain as it was in Tume, it's always windy and rainy in Tume, yeah. as far as I can tell. Um yeah. he started it out near the corner flag, I think, and then you didn't see the ball again until it was dropping between the posts. And that was just one of his points. He was he was he, he seemed to be just on one yesterday and um you know, with the other kind of, you know, threats they have in their attack, he's obviously considered maybe number three or four in that attack. But um, I think he showed us yesterday what he really is capable of if he's if he has to carry the mantle, so to speak. And he, I, like he's also he's very rangy. I mean, he's an he's an excellent kick out option as well. He's mm-hmm. ve- like you can he can drop into midfield just as easy. He's as comfortable there as he is playing in, in on the wing or anywhere in the half forward line. Um, a brilliant footballer, just an all round, and 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 I suppose from a Galway perspective, I think what's really pleasing, I'd say, from Park Joyce's point of view, is at a time when he probably, you know, he's he's still missing Shane Walsh, and obviously Comer now is out for a bit, so someone else steps up. I think that's a big thing from Joyce's point of view that he's got more leaders to lead in the attack in this absence, and like with the game, I think I don't remember the last time. God, have Galway ever been beaten in Tume? Like I just, I think, um, I think most it, teams are beaten by the time they get on. Yeah, the it's in just, Tume. it's just, it's the spiritual home of Galway football, as we know. I mean, it's the home, of, it's the home of Jarlets and uh, and the college and all of that. And it's, it's just that it's just one of those places. I, I didn't think it was a particularly good game. It was obviously spoiled by the conditions. But I, like, I think Galway would be delighted. They have two points on the board now, which kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off. But it's very congested in Division 1. Anything could happen, you know, oh, uh, over the next couple of games. Oh, 100% it can. It's, um, it's, it's definitely still um, all to play for. And David, um, our friends in the North, Monaghan, they, uh, 
you know the <laughs> reports of their uh of their um demise have been greatly exaggerated as always you know people always say oh no this year manhunt they're doomed and uh they just go and hand out a, a fairly significant spanking to Donny Call yesterday classic an eight point win. classic yeah. money um you know they've got their you know you know you get back the likes of Jack McCarron Darren Hughes Conor McManus off the bench you know those lads fairly well David um they are going to make a difference to any team and I suppose we may be a bit harsh judging Monaghan without those three or particularly at this stage McCarron and Hughes I guess because McManus isn't really a starter put them in any team and it makes a big difference oh it does yeah um just it's weird it's a it's a funny division one like uh, uh Donegal go beat Kerry and then Monaghan travel down to Killarney and get a trim and blow on Killarney and next minute <laughs> they go up and they beat Donegal well it's it's uh it's a it's a it's a funny looking uh I don't know do the the Ulster teams not travel well or or does Killarney just throw teams off or anything like that but um no, it's uh, Monaghan. They just pop up every year when they need results, and the big players stand up from all the time. Um, and they're breeding young fellas in there as well, so which is great. And they're just they're getting ready for the championship or the championship as well. And it's this uh, the league is a great place to to breed in these young players. Yeah, and they always seem to just they always seem to have a, a, a supply of them, Niall, because it's not a, it's not a huge playing population by any means. But Monaghan have been, you know, people say, oh, this great Monaghan team. You know, or this, you know, golden era. This is two or three generations of players now. This isn't the same. Like, there's a few lads, obviously, who overlap. Like Conor McManus's career is going into yeah. its well into its 15th, 16th year at this stage. But like, they do regenerate, and um, it's impressive how they do so. Yeah, and uh, I think Vinny has to. He was a late appointment, and you know, he lost Drew Wiley, he lost Colin Walsh, two absolute brilliant servants, Ryan McInnesley, Neil Cairns away. Uh, no Andrew Woods about it at the moment. So those are five starters probably from the last year or two so he's lost a third of his team but I think getting Stephen O'Hanlon back on board uh, brilliant basketball player absolutely lightning player he was brilliant again yes he is a top top class player and Sean Jones we talked earlier about subs coming off the bench in a scheme by uh, I mm. think he hit one too he, he's a fantastic player he's fantastic he was brilliant for that Monaghan on the 20 team that got to go for final a couple of years ago he's a real product so they always seem to be able to have three or four really good Pretty diminutive uh, scoring forwards, and as you see, a Jack McCarn. It was a, it was a novelty a few weeks ago when when you asked me to see if I could get an injury update in Jack McCarn, and uh, I texted Vinny and he texted back the update, and I'm like, usually with a lot of counties, you have to go through about five different men just to get told no, we're not going to comment on it. So things are still pretty old fashioned at <laughs> Monaghan, and uh, they still like their scoring forwards. It's, it's a funny you should mention that because it was you I wanted to ask on the Donegal point. Um, that uh, during the week, uh, Donegal released a statement saying Paddy McBeard was going to have a fitness test. Mm-hmm. Presumably, he failed the fitness test because he now has to go for uh, surgery on his hamstring, and we wish him a speedy recovery. But um, you're well used to this, Niall, aren't you? This, uh, this statements that could be put out by county boards, which which may be maybe not if they're not if they're not untruths, they're at least slightly misleading. Or yeah, they, all yeah. they're doing is buying time. Yeah, maybe it was buying time and maybe they were waiting for a second set of results or something. Uh, certainly on the day the word was around was that, you know, it was a very serious injury before the statement there had been a word that it was a serious injury. So when you see a statement, you probably expect to see it to be confirmed. Maybe it was uh, they were just waiting for a second uh, prognosis there just to be doubly sure. But it's it's a huge, huge blow to lose Michael Murphy um, yeah. and then to lose your talisman after that. Um, is, is shocking like you know and they, they were a bit unlucky Jamie Brennan hit the bar when it was 11 all and that could have changed the outcome but their next match is in Letterkenny we talked about June there uh, Donegal never lose in Ballybuffet but they never win in Letterkenny <laughs> <you know? laughs> <laughs> things may, may get a bit worse but it's it's going to be a tough finish to leave for them, yeah. okay um Moving on to matters of the second tier then, and um, I think we'll we have to start in Parky Cueve. We'll give you a little reprieve there, David, before we get on to, uh, on to Kildare's win in Clare. Um, Rory, it was, before we talk about the refereeing, um, as we mentioned there, halftime, Desi rolls out, uh, yeah. James and Jack, uh, you, I, you're fearing the worst, but um, Cork, you know, Cork made them work very hard for this, and Cork, Cork impressed in, uh, at stages here, especially especially in attack. I think there was a lot to lot to like, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. There, st- 
still I would consider a, a very much a work in progress, but improving. Um, these moral victories probably need to start turning into real victories, and that needs to start happening fairly quickly. I would suggest, but the half forward line, I'm you know, it's you look again, scoring return not great. You probably need a little bit more from that. Brian Hurley isn't going to shoot the lights out every week, um, so I suppose if you're kind of dependent on one inside forward makes you very predictable for opposition teams just to snuff him out and then where do you go for your scores I wouldn't have probably pulled Stephen Sherlock as early as the management did yesterday he's a confidence player and I would have probably left him I was on just going to see Rory immediately Hurley Hurley missed two frees right after he was taken off as well didn't he if, uh, if I remember correctly so the yeah. timing really went against him yeah exactly like and it's just yeah, I think there were a lot, lot, lot of very good positives. I mentioned on the podcast on Thursday when we had um, Wheelow and uh, Eamon Fitz on and Dara, I actually gave Cork a chance in this game. And I thought at times they did play some good football, but you again, you kind of just, you were looking at Dublin and you were saying, will the real Dublin stand up? Is that, was that the real Dublin? The issue for Dublin, I would suggest, I think... You have to be very careful that you don't allow a complacency start to kind of spread into your game. When you drop down into Division 2, you can get away with a few things that maybe Division 1 football sharpens you on. And there can be a malaise start to creep into your game that you may not even be aware of. And it's only when you kind of come up against the really tier one teams and didn't affect them last year. As we know, they went to the semi-final and were only a kick of a ball away from beating Kerry. But that's a full year now of playing division two teams. No disrespect whatsoever. And of course, here comes the disrespect, but like the <laughs> likes of Limerick and Lowe's, that's not going to be great prep from a Dublin perspective going into whatever group stages they end up in. Ah, uh, but they so have the Leicester Championship to sharpen themselves, Rory. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just, yeah, I suppose it's it's a funny position that Desi Farrell finds himself in, in that I think Division 2 has probably served him well in that it's allowed him continue a, w a winning culture while getting loads of new faces into the team. But I'm not entirely sure how many of them will he say, right, Grant, I'm going to hang my hat on that guy or this fella has definitely put his hand up. I think you could end up, by the time we see Dublin in Championship, seeing a lot of the familiar faces back in the starting 15 once again. Yeah, because there is, David, it's like kind of, you know, there's an opinion out there. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there's the opinion out there that maybe Dublin are not, not cruising or coasting, but like they're not maybe, you know, they're not... They're obviously not the Dublin that you see, say, against Kerry in the All Ireland semi final last year. What like they're not, they're not at that pitch, and maybe no teams are. But as Rory says, you know, if you're in Division One, you have to be closer to that pitch, you know, to get to get a win, especially away from home, etc. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe, yeah, it's a fair point. Dublin, they might be looking okay, and people say ah, they're just kind of ticking over. But you can't just tick over through the league and then tick over through the Leinster Championship and then expect to hit your straps in what is a new competition, you know, new new format, um, with a, more stress on your squad and everything else. So, uh, it's a tricky situation for Desi Farrell, isn't it? Yeah, it is tricky for Desi, and I suppose um, you see a lot of new faces there in the in the first few games. I suppose he's trying to give people a lot of game time to see if they're up to the pace. I know it's it's not Division One pace, but um, I, I see a lot of. Uh, I only got to see the last probably half an hour of the Dublin uh, Cork game yesterday now, but it's a lot of familiar faces coming off the bench to get them over the line. Um, a few of the a few. Silly decisions, especially one there at the end of the game where they did four and three overlap, and uh, the runner, um, I think, was um, hit a pot shot just at the end of it. Um, sorry, I can't think of his name now, but um, he in the old Dublin, they would have worked that into a scoreable to give it to the fresher kicker, like a Dean Rock or Conor Callahan, and pop it over the bar. But he took an uh, aimless shot with his left and dropped a wide. Um, I don't know, does, does it kind of creep into you when you're in Division 2 that um, you don't have to make the I suppose the right decisions or to make silly decisions or lazy decisions or looking to be a bit of a Mayfainer or something like that? Um, 
which there is the also there's, by, there's the pressure isn't there that you know if you want to break into yeah. the Dublin starting 15 you have to make a name for yourself yeah. how do you make a name for yourself by scoring a lovely point off your off your left foot yeah. is there a suggestion maybe Desi's more open to those than he always got the impression from Jim Gavin he was a bit of a uh, Joe Schmidt kind of he's like oh no you know it was a great score yeah. but it was the wrong team score team. you know <laughs> so That's like it, yeah it's, it's a bit difficult player, for the like, new fellows isn't it it is. It's like, but like managers and selectors, they look at players that sacrifice their games or make runs and stuff like that um, off the ball to create space for other players inside in the forwards. And um, like they all see that. But um, yeah, just the, the pot shots and some silly uh, shot selections there yesterday. But um, yeah, I'd say they're just kind of ticking over at the moment. And um, It'll be, it'll be, you know, um, the Derry game will be a big test from in own. Um, I think it's at Celtic Park. I think the game is on, um, but that'll really test them and see how how they, how far they've come. Yeah, that 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 is the game we're going to talk about Derry because obviously you, you were on the coverage of that game on um, Saturday evening. David. Um, we have to get on to the to the red cards, Niall. They're um, I was going to say they've been hotly debated, but they haven't really. Everyone has just been. Um, been castigating the referee on this one so I'll play devil's advocate here and say that Seamus Mulher in the case of uh, Ian Maguire at least was um, you know he was going by the letter of the law you know what you know Maguire made three of these fouls four of these fouls and by by the rule book you know he gave he gave the yellow card at the right occasion and then the red card came I can defend I can almost defend the first yellow, but I don't think I could defend the second yellow because the contact was was so minimal that it's hard it, it's hard even for me playing devil's advocate here to 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 say that he went by the rule book because the 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 second yellow was just such an innocuous like contact it was ridiculous yeah yeah the first one you can you can argue accumulation so you can scratch that off and say okay fair enough and um, if you're gonna take a wider lens view in it um I just feel referees are being let down by the GA here. Um, they're not going out of the way to be this pernickety. You know, they're not going out of the way to referee a game differently than 20 years ago. They're obviously getting direction because it's it's turned into almost a non-contact sport, uh, a sport that's just so um, connected and, and welded to these rules and, and by the book by the letter of the law but that's the sport's not always by the letter of the law you can you can make an argument like but there has to be there has to be more freedom given to officials to not dish out cards at every opportunity like i, I was coming home from this comment i was listening to the match on the radio and it was just card after card after card and the johnson commentary were obviously getting very frustrated even watching but i don't blame the referee i i blame what referees are being told to do because you don't get that high you don't get on the inter-county championship and league panels unless you're doing something right in the view of GA mm-hmm. assessment so we can take it as read that these in the eyes of GA are all very good referees and they all are very good referees they're giving up a lot of time they're doing the best their ability but there has to be there, there's a bigger issue here it has to be a play where this is being taught that this is how you you referee these games and to be honest it sounded a brilliant game and we're coming away and we're all talking about the referee and it, it sort of it didn't spoil the game but it's still the prevailing thing coming out of coming out of the game and this is just such a common thing for us to discuss in this podcast about how there's been cards thrown out where there shouldn't have been and should have been allowed to play and it, it's it's one of them you know Jarla Burns is in now is you know I know he's talking about reviews amateur status and all but Jeez, he has to have a review of how referees and officials are approaching our game because it's just a whistle happy culture that spoils a lot of contests um, and it's just taking a lot of the fun, a lot of enjoyment out of our games and it seems to be getting worse every year. It seems to be getting contacts lighter, uh, frees are more frequent, cards are more prevalent. And it just it's it's a scourge on the association right now. <laughs> the Ar- the Armand man. I think it's uh, just on uh, that. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, then. <laughs> just on just on the refereeing. Are are the referees are they afraid of the assessors? Um, like if they, because like we used to hear from Colm all the time. There's an assessor above in the stands, and he's watching these games. He's watching the refs. The refs are going by the book. Are the referees like saying, right, sure, if I don't give this yellow card as a bit and the yellow card, am I going to be? I don't know, throwing down to Division 3 for not going by the book. Are they afraid? That's It just yeah, looks well, like well, it. 
they're clearly going to get marked down. Like he might, I don't know, I don't know enough yeah. about it. No, but you know, maybe he would have got marked down if he didn't award that second yellow because by the letter of the law, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, but who in the right mind thought that was a yellow card? Like no one, no one. But if no, you're, not actually, you're saying yeah. David, if, if that's they're there to you know please the assessor rather than referee the game, and yeah. again take the blame a lot off the referee. There it, it comes to the structures we mm. have with teaching and and how we're allowing referees or telling them how to referee yeah. these games. As you can tell, I feel very strong about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that. I'm, I know. I'm just, I'm just saying there about the, like, we always hear it. Like, I was up up in uh, Owen Bega on Saturday night and I thought the referee was brilliant. He let the game go. He let the game flow. And like, there was a lot of harder tackles going in than there was down in, in Parky, uh, Parky Cueve. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, just, I don't know. Actually, it's one of, the, one of the things, David, when there's really, really heavy rain, and that reads, you do the amount of heavy games played in, in torrential conditions where you see it, oh, the ref adjusted for the conditions and let them go. But yeah. here on a dry pitch, it seems to be a different, a different thing. But that's, uh, I don't know. And again, I, I don't want to get stuck in the referees personally because mm-hmm. they're, they're really stressful, they don't get much help, etc. etc. So for me, it's more an issue <clears throat> at, at the overall rather than individuals. Yeah, I think, May Mikey, I just, I know it's a bit of a rabbit hole and I just have one key point I'd like to make and it's to follow up what Niall mentioned about Jarlett Burns and first thing is to say is congratulations to Jarlett and you wish him well I think there's been a number of different subjects that you know people have proposed that oh he needs to you know strategic reviews or deal with Doug Beatty and unionism or deal with Caseman Park to my mind the single biggest crisis that's faced the GAA at the moment is refereeing. It's recruitment of refereeing. It's the quality of refereeing. We are lucky enough to have three adult teams in my club. All three of them started their league campaigns yesterday. The first team, the second team, and the third team. The third team match never went ahead. Why? No referee turned up. Why was there no referee turned up? Because there just simply isn't enough referees. Nobody wants to do the job anymore. This is a massive problem. So what ends up happening is if you have a dearth of numbers, you then have a dearth of quality. And that feeds its way up the food chain. So of all the problems that I'm sure will be sitting on Jarlett Burns in tray when he eventually does take the office in a permanent role in next year, if he manages to do anything to arrest the decline in refereeing recruitment, he'll have done the association a big service, in my view. Yeah, um, and, and Jarlett Burns, um, and I know you, you know him really well now, um, and I know Kieran touched on it very well here about, you know, how much can, can a ref, how much can a GA president do? It does seem his win, which was fairly well expected, but quite convincing. People are expecting, Niall, that Jarlett Burns is going to, Seem, okay, seemingly crusader. solve yeah, yeah. all the problems of the GAA. Um, now he's a competent, capable man. He's a great speaker, and I know he's he 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 has wanted this job for a long time as well. And he's 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 climbed exact the the pole, etc. But there's a, there's people are expecting them to change the world, and that's just not the job of a GAA president. They don't they don't get to change. They might get one big issue if they're lucky, if it falls in their lap, and they can correct drive it on. But they like people expecting him to like put out fires in seven or eight different places that's a it's a lot of pressure to put on the guy and it's probably a little bit unrealistic yeah yeah when you think about it most presidents have one legacy issue associated mm-hmm. to their name and that's that's probably will be the case with jarla too i do think he will be one of the most active presidents we've ever had in terms of getting stuck into the issues and um, larry mccarthy was a bit unfortunate and perhaps jarla was a bit fortunate in losing the last time out because mm-hmm. COVID obviously COVID. uh you know, really impacted on his reign. And if Jarl had to come in uh, three years ago, as it was, like, it would have, you know, his reign would have been impacted. So I'm really pleased. I, 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 a lot of time from, I think he's an absolute gentleman. He's mm. a real magnetism too. Um, I think he will take a couple of missteps. I'd rather a braver present taking missteps than someone who's happy just to go along with the flow. Uh, I think Rory's right there, and you're right there, Mikey. In terms of what issues, there's been a lot of debate about, you know, uh, inclusivity, uh, unionism, different things. I think in real life terms, that will actually be a massive thing during this term, to be honest with you. Um, it's a very plain situation. There's parts of the unionist community that are 
willing to engage with the GA and there's parts of the unionist community that will not be willing to. Jarlett knows that. He will work with whoever wants to work with him. And I, I think that's an issue that'll, that'll really not be as big as some people are expecting. And um, it is just going by speaking to Marty Mars, you know, like he, he seems to really have focused in on his key issue. And it's not referee, and I wish it was, but it's it's this amateur status and workload. And he seems really, really, you know, just any post match interview or sorry, post election interview he's done, he's talked about amateur status reports and, and the long time since we've had one. So that seems to be priority number one for, I suppose, his year as president elect. I'd say we're getting a lot of ducks in a row, get that report. We're going, we're obviously going to see that report during his time. And um, what impacts, I don't know, it can have. But I think he's brilliant. I think he's a brilliant man. I think he's going to be a brilliant president. I think he's going to annoy people. Uh, I think he's going to divide people on certain issues. And brilliant. I think he's going to lead the association in a better place. Yeah. Um, we. I'm also interested in the vote that we'll see Kerry go into the Munster Championship. The, the lauded Munster Championship will finally play its part in the development of hurling, uh, but we can discuss that on Thursday, hopefully with a Munster pundit. Uh, sorry, David, the time has come. Um, we've got very little else to talk about now except Claire V. Kildare. Um, this, yeah, look, the, 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 this was a hard one to swallow. And I was on here a couple of weeks ago wondering whether this idea that Glenn Ryan and his, you know, his backroom team, uh, dream dream team, um, maybe this idea that they were going to instill, you know, you know, added backbone into the Kildare team, etc. I was wondering after um, they they lost to Cork whether that was actually going to happen, but they proved me wrong because if they, if nothing else, they showed um, a hell of a lot of backbone yesterday. Even you probably through gritted teeth will have to admit that. Yeah, they did. I suppose the funny thing about it is the game game turned when Kildare got a man sent off. Um, and usually it does. Like it's 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 funny how things work. Like there was no pressure on Clare before that. They were comfortably playing around the ball, moving up and down the fields well, kicking scores. And the minute the man got sent off, it's just I don't know. It's and I suppose Daniel Flynn uh, came on as a sub. He was chasing down everything. He was like two or three players running around the place. Um, he was getting on the ball. He was setting up scores. Um, but it was just a frustrating finish. Um, Clare had the chances to. Um, Aaron Griffin towards the end was uh, true. Probably should have fisted it over the bar. I tried to punt it over the bar. I'm not too sure what he tried to do coming in from an angle. But that would have sealed sealed the game. And um, as momentum goes, Kildare won the kick out down the field, got a point, brought a level. And then, uh, yeah, I think it was, a, it was a dubious free given in towards the last last play of the game for Kildare's winner, which is... Now, I, I was at the other end of the field. But Are you blaming the assessor in the stand? I I would blame the assessor <laughs> in the stand, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, um, no, it's it's it was a hard uh, hard pill to swallow. Um, I know how Mickey Hart felt after the Clare game mm. in the first round. Um, like like it's funny with Clare. Clare could Clare could have six points on the board, or they could have zero points on the board. That's that's the yeah. that's the thing about it at the moment. But um, the Sigerson Cup final uh, over now. Clare had seven players involved in that during the week. Um, three of them played full uh, eighty minutes. Um, we have a lot of injuries. Kieran Russell came back yesterday, which is which is great. Carl O'Connor pulled his hamstring. Uh, he was a massive loss in the game. Um, but with Keelan Sexton, hopefully, probably might be too soon to be back for the Dublin game. Hopefully, he'll be back after that. But it's just the injuries, and I think everything combined is we haven't seen the full Clare team yet. Um, so hopefully, we can see it in the next few weeks because it's. It's uh they need they need two big wins they need three big wins out of the last four games mm. um so it's gonna be it's it's a it's a dog fight down there yeah you have they to u- they, u- they usually get them <laughs> yeah yeah they yeah get those wins <laughs> they're the Manahan of division two yeah. Uh, yeah but David that you know you listed off there between injuries and lads involved in the Sigerson Cup latter stages there is a squad there like Colin Collins like there there's a bit of depth there and obviously maybe the first fifteen isn't as strong as you would like it to be at the moment but. That is still the blooding of players who might be useful finishers, as we talked about at the start. So um, I know there's absolutely no desire to be relegated from Division Two, but at the same time, a testing a testing league campaign is no harm. And now, hopefully, I suppose you can look at it and say, get players fit, get the get the college lads back, and hopefully we'll we'll see the true Clare team in the next few weeks. Yeah, I suppose the Dublin game is probably coming a bit too soon. I suppose um, I think um, is there two is there two week break after that? For 
the next one, one is it one week break no, a one no week two, break no two week breaks no, anymore two week. no no two yeah. weeks um but no i'd say we should see the hopefully the the, the full care team come out in the next few weeks and uh uh, listen, it'll be it'll be great, it'll be great challenge for them, and we'll see where they are. Um, so hopefully, t- hopefully, two wins now will keep us in Division Two, and then we can move on to the Munster Championship first round. Yeah, um, on Kildare and Niall, um, there, there's there's no get, there's no getting away from it. Um, Dan, Daniel Flynn is the is is the man for this team, and um, he proved it the other the, he proved it there yesterday, um, but the. They are consistency is still the thing with Kildare, isn't it? And it has been for for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Like the first game against Dublin, if, you know, a, a bit more rootless in front of goal, they probably should have won that match. Then they get jockeyed by Cork. Then yes, they're they're looking second best for you know sixty five minutes of the game, and they're a very very hard side to work out. They really are. I don't know how good they are, and I don't know how bad they are. I just I, I struggle to to really mark down where Kildare are, are as a force. And, you know, if they lose that match yesterday, um, yeah. you know, suddenly the Tolton Cup comes into view for them, like, in all honesty, because they have to play Derry, who are going to be no soft touch. They have to play Mead as well. Like, so they have a, they still have a tricky programme ahead of them. So, but it's, that's, we go back to the league being such a super competition, a, a late dubious free, as David says there, and all of a sudden their season has a very different outlook. Um, I was just looking at the league table there, like nearly every division, it's uh, it's amazing how much, how many positions are still in the relegation zone on, on scoring difference, like, but, you know, another win or two in the next couple of games and could be right up there in the top four, and it's, it's just, it's it's such, such an important win for them, massive win, because, you know, three three defeats in a row for a team that came down from Division One. Um, we've seen teams like Cavan and Derry fall through the trap door of two and three and move on down. And it, it's once you start that slide, it's very hard to arrest it. So a massive win, a massive win, and you know, Clare will be kicking themselves obviously, but uh, big big win for Glen Ryan. It mentioned there, Rory uh, Derry, whose uh, spectre does loom large over Division Two this yep. year. Um, David was at the match. We'll chat to him in a second, but. You know more than double scores against me than you know. I, I think Colin O'Rourke was expecting a, may was may have been expecting or banking on a reality check here, and he got it because Derry, you know, they looked the real deal for a long time last year. Um, they're definitely they're a year older and a year wiser, and they, yeah. they 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 look like the real deal. Really, like they're so defensively strong and like they have such such good forwards who can live off kind of. You know the meager amounts of possession that they might get with the style of play they have. Oh yeah, I think they have just doubled down on where they were in twenty two, and they've just tried to soup it up a bit. Like I mean, they play at home uh, on Saturday night, but I think more significantly to that, and this is where home advantage I think does become a key factor. I think they train. I, I, they train in Owen Beg. Not too many teams yeah. will actually train where they play the games as well. And I think that's that's uh, uh, like have they I don't know anybody that's gone up there and actually come away with a win. Um, goal just before half time, ten point lead at the break, and chin chin. Uh, like the game was over, they were impressive. Did we see anything new? I I'd argue no. Um, what we did see is the same style, but as I said, maybe slightly more souped up. I think they've kind of re- they're really in their stride now with how they play the game. Are um, they very fit, Rory? They're unbelievably <laughs> fit, right? They, but it's 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 a low block without the ball. That's a given. And then they pour forward in big numbers once they like. I mean, I but a, mo- most modern intercounty teams are kind of playing that type of game same anyway. Same system, yeah. Yeah, everybody kind of more or less plays the same type of system, and it's just a lot of it comes down to your fitness and the ability of your inside forwards then to take advantage when opportunities come. As you said, superbly fit terrific individual players Benny Heron still going strong was outstanding again great to see Shane McGuigan getting better I think they found something a little mercurial in this lad Cassidy I love a lad with the yeah. socks pulled up love a lad with the socks pulled up because he's easy to spot right um, I just think yeah they'll just double down on what we saw from them last year and hope to do it better faster and for longer the, the problem really for them will be when they come up against the team that it has a similar level of fitness and plays the game in a similar way as we saw last year when Galway just amended their game plan and mirror imaged them and just Galway had more quality. Um, I think that's where Derry will probably, um, that's where they will run into their biggest challenges in 23. Yeah. But that could take them a long way. I mean, they got to a mm-hmm. semi-final last year. 
who knows david they're they're very impressive but are they so impressive because you know this they're pretty much at full strength now and i'll might correct me on this but like they're, they're not missing too many um whereas other teams we see are kind of chopping and changing and are struggling with injuries etc cetera, etc cetera. so the very much would be Rory Gallagher's style is like you know get your get your best team out there and get them playing every game together and get them better they were impressive the other night but do you think there's room room for improvement shall we say because we are only in February um there is they're improving every game and I suppose this was probably their best performance of the league so far and um, they kind of struggled kind of against Limerick in the first game and I know they didn't have the Glynn boys playing um the last day against Louth as well um they struggled, yeah, they struggled to get over the line. I think it was only the last five, ten minutes they got over the line against Louth. But uh, they looked impressive. Straight from the word go, they were they were impressive. But um, you'd Eaton Doherty come back into the play, kicked one, two, kicked, got off to a great start for the goal. Um, Cassidy centre forward. Um, Sean Cavanaugh was talking highly of him um, at the start of the game and he was really impressed with him. And they found a full back as well in um, is it McAvoy. Is McAvoy um the yeah, corner McAvoy, at the full yeah. Yeah. yeah and he was he was impressive too got up the field I think he kicked the score um but like that that frees up somebody else to uh for another position which which you need I think they said last year that he was kind of a bit too young to throw in there so but giving him his go now but um I, I think Meath were probably very they're very naive I suppose they still went with the kicking game um. First half into the wind and aimless kicks into the full forward line with her. Derry, like even um, uh, they said at the end of the game, the man of the match, uh, McGrogan, uh, said that they kind of knew what was going on. It was going to be the, the kicking ball and they set up properly. They they stopped it out. Um, Meats meet were kind of impressive when they worked the ball. Uh, in the first half, they got their two scores from working the ball through the hands and then they went back into kicking again and um, just fell into Jerry's lap, but um, yeah, they looked they looked pretty, very impressive the last day now, and um, they were clicking well. The runs are moving well, um, so yeah, they they look good. They look good around all around. Uh, so Niall, are you going to correct me? Have we have we many uh, Derry players to come back in here, or is this like Rory Gallagher's full hand? No, no, no. They're they're pretty strong now. Uh, Emmett Brady's not involved, but. The rumours are he won't be involved this year uh, for them, um, which would be a, a fair old blow given how, how good he was for Glenn. Uh, but they're 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 pretty much full strength. They got the Glenn boys back in, Connor Glass, Ethan Dofty, things like that. Uh, brought up brought in Connor McGuckin this year to the squad who had a good season for Glenn. Um the only thing I'd say is they are near full strength, but they're look like one of these panels that have 25 interchangeable players. Um McGregor obviously is the the goal dust off front, but I think for most positions to have players ready made to come in. And a lot of them, I was just looking at a match report there from uh, their All Ireland minor final last year, and the likes of McGrogan and Conor McCluskey have made the breakthroughs. The day David Clifford scored four four, if you remember. Yeah. Um, but to have the had a number of brilliant minor club teams win also the club competitions. They've had you know success at obviously at minor and under twenty county level. Maharas and Pat's Maharas and St. Mary's Maharafelt have been producing brilliant players. Mahara always have St. Mary's Maharafelt in the last decade have really turned into a, a real force at Ulster Schools level up in up in the province here. And they just seem to have almost like thrown did for so long, a conveyor belt of players coming through. Um, you would say maybe look outside maybe Glass and McGuigan, you wouldn't say they look like they have many superstars, but that's just the way Gallagher sets the team up. I think I don't think they're they're very much about the sum of all parts rather than individualism. And I I genuinely I genuinely think and, and I know we're what are we February twentieth. I genuinely think these are all Ireland contenders. Like I I really do because they just mirror Dublin so much in terms of strength and fitness. Um, and I would imagine in a couple of weeks' time we might have them two going at it at Crow Park in the league final or wherever that is. Um, don't given, yeah, that's where no one goes up and wins and no one begging. Don't given the fact that they're playing Dublin at Celtic Park probably yeah. dampens their their hopes a wee bit. But if they are playing Dublin at Owen Beg right now, I would be very very confident of Dublin beating or Derry beating them. 
Um, right. Okay, it's 20th of February. Rory usually gets in the first All Ireland <laughs> prediction of the podcast season, but you you beat them to it, Niall. Rory, you left up your oh, game. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you have his hurling yeah. prediction ready yeah. now uh, for next. Yeah, it's, 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 he'll shock us all by saying Limerick are going to win the hurling on Thursday. Uh, I will listen. What a story! What a story! Imagine if De- for Derry to go, even for them, because uh, that was one of the standout things of the 2022 Championship uh, for me was Derry and Armagh and the colour that they brought and the yeah. razzmatazz and the freshness by having another couple of teams being able to compete and certainly be able to match all the top teams and potentially get into an All-Ireland final and maybe even win one. I think that's mm. only to be welcomed in a, you know, for people that look at the big picture. Yeah. Now, with just a quick breeze through the other divisions just to mention so for, for those counties with, with more modest hopes and aspirations. Um, Division 3 is shaping up very interesting. Obviously, Fermanagh got that um, smash and grab win against Down. Big win, yeah. Uh, Cavan, Cavan beat Longford heavily and uh, <laughs> West Westmead kind of uh, came from behind as a lot of teams have just said to be awfully. Um, but it's interesting. Longford are on no points and Waterford are on no points in Division 4. Those you you might have said would have totally shock you, but for Tipperary to have no points in Division Three at this mm-hmm. stage is is quite a surprise, and you'd know them better than most. David, there's an awful lot of turnover there in the last couple of years. Um, David Power, he 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 kind of up against it there, really, to kind of build a new team from you know not the greatest of playing resources, I suppose, in the country. And Connor Sweeney yeah, it's, gone for the year. Connor Sweeney, mm. oh yeah, Connor, I think was probably the the last last um, probably the, the gold generation left that that uh, mm. won the Munster fine in the twenty or the under twenty ones as well. Um, but it was uh, yeah, there there's nobody. Uh, it doesn't look like there's anybody really coming through to really stand out. Um, Connor Connor Sweeney, who should he be gone for the year? He's at uh, Quinlevin's not around. I think I don't know. Is he going traveling? They tried America, to get. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he they tried there. reared was a reared in trying to they're trying to get him back before the year, but mm. I think he's staying outside in Australia. Um but it's it, it doesn't look good for Tipperary. Um they're just they're just they're just struggling badly at the moment and it looks it looks in the cards that they'll probably go down. Yeah. Um and then division four, uh good win for Sligo against Watford, which are, are a bit of a soft touch, unfortunately, these days. Leash keep winning, they beat Carlo and um Wexford beat Leitrim in an absolute clinker by all accounts. It was uh, it was it was to and fro, but um, high flying Leitrim have had their wings cut, so um, there you go, Wexford for Talton. Um, we'll wait and see, lads. Um, been a pleasure. Um, and I hope now Niall and David, you feel a little bit better now than you did coming into the podcast. That's all me and Rory want to do. We just want to we just want to help people. Um, we've got it off our chest now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I am the agony aunt after all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I don't know how Lee Keegan will feel after this podcast. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> or or Kevin like, day. The, the, what I'd be saying to Lee is the the microphone and the pundits mic will always be there. The Mayo jersey might not. Uh, some of your colleagues may be calling me after the podcast too, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, if Rory survives till Thursday, we'll be back to preview yeah, the football exactly. and hurling action. And uh, we will chat to you then. So thank you, Niall. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rory. And good luck. We'll see you soon. Bye. From this, how much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar!